Hello and welcome to this week's My News Wrap, news from the world of SAP, Microsoft and the world in between. Episode 51. So let's start the next 50 episodes. Um, let's start with the SAP part of the house. So first of all, I would like to highlight a blog post by Murali Shangmuham, um, who blogged a bit about the SAP BTP Launchpad service and the, the top five reasons why it makes sense to um, use this service on BTP in order to extend your SAP solutions. Um, yeah, it's kind of a, a I, I wouldn't call it high level in the negative sense, a high level overview in the positive sense about um, why it makes sense to make use of this service and, and what are the consequences or the, the advantages if you adopt that service. So um, if you're thinking about using the SAP BTP Launchpad service, I think that's kind of a good starting point in order to um, yeah, wrap your head around this topic. There are also a lot of links within this uh, blog post um, that guide you to additional information. So take a look at that one. Then the exploration of DJ Adams of the BTP CLI continues. Last week we had the installation, so the, the setup of the BTP CLI for you. And this week um, DJ brought out another blog post about logging in, so how to connect your BTP CLI to your um, SAP BTP uh, tenant, global account, sub account, um, how to set things up and where to find the necessary information to make the um, connection to BTP. I think there is also uh, the, the Friday um, video podcast of DJ that also dives into the BTP CLI. So if you want to get started with BTP CLI, I think the blog post as well as the um, uh, videos that or the, the, the live streams that DJ does every Friday um, are currently the right place to go. Then um, one not so funny thing, a kind of a pattern now the second week with the SAP community. I don't know what's what's going on there, to be honest. I would have had a quite nice blog post about uh, the cloud application programming model, making use of the geospatial functionality within HANA and how to bring things together. And for those of you who watch now this, this uh, podcast, um, you will see again a page not found uh, site when you go to the link. Um, no idea what's currently happening with SAP community. I hope this will not be a, a pattern that's coming up that um, blog posts are deleted. Um, but let's see. Having said that, fortunately, there is another blog post that was not deleted yet, I don't know, um, about um, using um, Kima as an extension platform. And the scenario is quite interesting. You have a third-party application that exposes a REST API, and it is um, kind of configurable. So there is a, a NoSQL database underneath that is more or less exposed via the, the REST API. It's a scenario from the analytics world. And the extension now proxies kind of the communication towards the SAP systems, which would, would like to have an OData um, interface in order to get the, the data out of this third party app. And the solution that is proposed within this blog post is quite interesting. So it kind of puts two apps in between, one Python application on Kima and one Cup application on Kima. Um, basically one for, for reading out the data and uh, transforming it into a stable format. And then the Cup application in order to have a very easy setup um, with respect to exposing this data then as a well-defined um, OData service. So quite interesting um, scenario and I think really um, real-world scenario. Now with that, let's switch to uh, Microsoft side of the house and of course to serverless, the most important area in the world. Um, yeah, if you want to catch up with uh, serverless and what happened um, within Microsoft Azure with respect to serverless, then I highly recommend the um, session on channel nine called Hello World Serverless about serverless. Um, catching up with everything from Azure Logic Apps to Azure Functions and of course to Azure Static Web Apps together with um, Anthony Chu. 
and a lot of other um, different product managers in that area kind of really getting you started with the topic on Azure. Then um, there is one blog post around um, bringing .NET 6 APIs in Azure Functions to life, um, especially making use of the minimal um, minimal API functionality within .NET 6. So as of now, as of yesterday, I think .NET 6 is now supported in preview, so some things might not be valid anymore um, within the um, within the blog post because the setup on Azure has changed, but um, it's really interesting to read and interesting to see what's possible with this new feature within .NET 6. So if you take a look at the code with respect to the uh, minimal API, um, that's, that's really minimal. So there is really nearly nothing in there and everything is done for you with this uh, .NET functionality. So really, really cool. Then um, another blog post around a real, let's say, really live problem with um, Azure Functions and um, in general, clients, SDK clients. And this blog post describes how to do dependency injection right with Azure Functions and the Neo4g client. <clears throat> uh, why, why is it important? Because um, if you just put in the, the, the client without further thinking, you have a lot of instances created during runtime of that client that are not necessary because you could rely to a singleton pattern. And um, this blog post guides you through how to do that and make use of the dependency injection that takes place when the function starts up. So that's um, really helpful, of course, C-sharp focused. Then an, an update on something that I've mentioned a few months ago. Um, Konstantin Lepeshenkov has uh, a little repo about these, this, what he calls durable MVC starter package, combining Azure Functions, Signal R, um, React, and TypeScript together um, in order to build a serverless web application. And within Azure Functions, especially as the name says, um, and durable entities. And there are some, some updates um, with respect to the repo that are definitely worth taking a look at. I've also referenced the repository per se um, within the show notes, so you can also directly jump to it. With that, um, let's switch to the other part that is important for developer applications, namely the container part. Um, there is one important, very important security um, information that got pushed out this week. If you're using Azure Container Instances or the Azure Container Instance Service ACI, um, please take a look at this blog post that I've referenced. It's the security note um, because there has been a, a disclosure of vulnerability on that service. And this blog post guides you through um, what was disclosed, what was the problem, are there customers um, having issues with that, um, what do you have to do, when do you have to do something. So um, if you're using HCI, uh, take ACI, not HCI, ACI, um, take a look at, at that blog post. Then um, I'm, I'm quite sure I mentioned that before, there is a regular Dapper community call taking place, I think every month, um, about all things Dapper. And this week there was another one, a really interesting agenda, especially with respect to Dapper with uh, dev containers and code spaces, so how you can, can use that one, but also about automatic encryption and, um, of course, DapperCon. So if you're working with Dapper, I think it's it's in general quite interesting to, to watch that uh, community call or even to participate in the live stream. And then um, one last topic from the area of containers or to be more precise from the area of the Azure Kubernetes service, AKS. Um, there was an Azure Friday session uh, yesterday, I think, um, about um, getting us a secure uh, production grade um, setup or, or baseline architecture of your AKS cluster um, in, 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 in Azure. Um, yeah, starting from, from, the, from the basics and then really um, learning about how far you can go with the security, even um, 
with regards to the, the very strict regulations with respect to the payment card industry data security standard. So, um, so if, if you're working with AKS, I think that's uh, really important for, for production grade clusters in order to wrap your head around these security things. Nobody likes them, but well, they're super necessary. Then um, DevOps, let's go to the DevOps part of the house. Um, there is um, the DevOps lab by Microsoft, which is covering all things DevOps on YouTube with uh, regular sessions. And there is one new, um, let's say, mini series around um, infrastructure as code within, um, um, within Microsoft Azure, making use of BICEP. And this uh, short series guides you through some um, more practical examples, so some problems that you might face. And the first episode goes all around naming conventions and how to make use of them within Azure Bytes app. So that's um, quite interesting. I've referenced the tweet as well as the uh, YouTube video within my show notes, so you can directly either jump to the channel or directly jump to the video. And then, um, as within the last weeks, GitHub keeps pushing out news uh, yeah, like crazy. Um, there is one YouTube short about a cool feature that um, is about issue pinning within your repo. So that's quite interesting. You, you, can, uh, you can pin the most important um, issues within your, your issue tab and have them, them on top. And this short uh, video guides you through how to do that. I think quite useful um, again something really for the um for the open source contributors and then a lot of announcements um around updates that will come up or have happened within the um github area um there is an upgrade plan for um september 15th so not too far in the future um where uh, there will be a CouchDB upgrade within NPM. And if you're replicating NPM or, or using making use of, of uh, certain replication mechanisms in order to have a local copy of that, um, be aware that there might be resets within the sequence numbers. So this might um, be an issue. So uh, take a look at that blog post that I referenced in the show notes. Then an update on GitHub Actions. Um, with respect to setup actions, you can now introduce cache dependency, uh, which is especially interesting if you're setting up your um, project with a monorepo approach, or if you're using PNPM package manager in order to uh, bundle dependencies across several projects. So that's now supported with GitHub Actions. Um, then there is a little bit of uh, improvement around revenue notifications with respect to the GitHub app in Microsoft Teams and Slack. So if you're using that, um, you might be interested in this update around um, revenue notifications. Then um, a blog post that kind of summarizes what happened over the last um, weeks or months around the GitHub code scanning functionality that they pushed out, that they um, integrated within the um, standard functionality of GitHub code scanning. And this blog post also highlights how you can use CodeQL in order to improve the, the code scanning for your individual use cases. And it also makes, um, I think, four examples within the blog post that shows you um, some things that GitHub thinks might be um, a reasonable or, or fruitful stuff that, that they might incorporate in the future in the standard code scanning approaches, but are currently not yet there. And you can use them and integrate them within your own code scanning uh, functionality, making use of CoQL. So um, again, super useful. And then there is um, a regular update on the GitHub issues. So um, the, the GitHub issues beta has another features that, that came out. Um, which make the life easier. And yeah, take a look at that because I think um, all the functionality that, that GitHub is pushing out is making life that much better for a developer when using uh, uh, GitHub. So it's really now about also planning and managing your work in, an, in a reasonable way, tracking your work and, and making those things 
although those are not things that anybody would like to do, making it more comfortable for you to do them so that you don't have um, that much headache around them. So that's that's really cool, really helpful, highly appreciated. And then um, also with respect to security and the, the, the um, security improvements that uh, GitHub is currently making, there is a sunset notice about the API authentication that was already announced. And GitHub will now or has stopped as of last week the support for API authentication via query parameters. So don't be surprised if you're using that and it does not work anymore. Then um, let's switch away from GitHub. Um, there is one reading list that I would like to bring to your attention around GitOps. So it's called uh, the ultimate list of GitOps resources um, with respect to articles, videos, and so on. I would say it's a curated list of GitOps resources, but if you are interested in that area or if you want to wrap your head around that, I think that's, again, a quite good starting point. And um, quite good area in order to um, keep be kept up to date um, with this um, very vibrant area of GitOps. And then another article um, from Heise, um, only available in German. So um, this article picks up the yeah, current problems that the project Terraform has. Um, um, Maybe you, you came across that, maybe not. Terraform or Project Terraform um, stopped the um, community pull requests due to being short of, of people. So they really have uh, a problem uh, that they have not enough folks in there working on pull requests. And that's why they stopped community pull requests. So they also laid that out within the GitHub repo in the um, a contributing readme that they have a shortage within staffing and they're currently searching for um i think it's yeah there are currently 100 um, open positions within the area of cloud engineering and it um yeah quite quite interesting to see uh, hopefully that's only temporal and only due to the fact that that the the organization is growing. Hopefully this is not a, a permanent problem then um, with respect to community contributions. Now with that, um, let's switch to the world between SAP and Microsoft. And of course, starting with the usual suspect, um, namely the SAP on Azure podcast. And this week again, great episode um, that came out today very developer focused with Martin Pankratz. And as you know, I'm a big fan of him. So um, definitely again, high quality content. And it's all about development within the, let's say, extended SAP ecosystem. Um, starting from, I think it's it's even SE80, I don't know. Yeah, starting with, with SE80 and how you develop there and then moving on towards Visual Studio Code and the ABAP extensions that are out there and um, then, of course, touching Copilot and, and those things and, and Copilot with JavaScript and so on. So that's, I think, again, really cool episode and developer focused, not infrastructure focused, which I like. And then um, one second topic from the area of SAP and Microsoft, um, shameless advertisement for a blog post by myself. Um, and for those who just listen, I'm, I'm getting a bit red, um, but not too much, about uh, binding Azure Functions to SAP Event Mesh. So um, I think a common pattern is to combine um, Azure with, with um, SAP. And at the end of the day, all the stuff has to be um, pushed to, to SAP that is happening within business applications at some point in time. Now, um, if you would do that with APIs, I think especially with APIs that are serverless or, or feed by by. Uh, serverless um, extensions, you might have fun because SAP systems do not scale like um, serverless functions. So it would make sense to bring in some, some messaging middleware like the SAP Event Mesh. And now from the point of view of an Azure developer, it should be as easy to push messages to the SAP Event Mesh 
And that's where custom bindings come in as an extension, um, as an extension mechanism within Azure Functions. Um, that allowed the developer to focus on his code. And the custom binding then takes over all the heavy lifting around authentication, about, about calling the right REST APIs and, and maybe reformatting the information so that um, the message could be pushed out in the right way. And this blog post kind of guides you through how to do that. It's not super difficult. Um, however, the, the GitHub repo that I referenced, it's not production ready, I would say, but it's, it gives you an impression uh, that the, the, um, the way to do that is not rocket science. So it's, it's really doable. Now with that, uh, let's switch to the area of learning and um, events that are upcoming. First of all, um, a little blog post that I would like to highlight by a colleague of mine who successfully uh, became a certified Kubernetes application developer. And within this blog post, he shares some tips and tricks around the, the Kubernetes exam, how to prepare um, for that um, exam. So first of all, congrats. And second, if you are also going down the path to become a certified Kubernetes application developer, again, um, read that one. Um, I think there are quite some, some useful information in there. And then um, last week, I think we had the second round of announcements of uh, upcoming events in, in autumn or fall. Um, and um, yeah, there is another event that, of course, is kind of the warm-up event for developers when heading towards TechEd. It's the DevToberfest that has its second edition now. And I referenced the blog post by Thomas Young explaining what's this year um, being, being uh, uh, presented within DevToberfest, how you can contribute. There are also all the references in there to the GitHub repository, um, where, there are even more, where there is even more information what happens at the DevToberfest and how you can contribute. So if you, you want to be part of that uh, game, take a look at it. Um, it's starting in October. so. You have a bit of a time to prepare for that. And um, yeah, finishing today's session with a little um, video by Eberhard Wolf from, from InnoQ, one of the, the architects um, and presenters there, um, who has also a regular, a more or less regular podcast, a video podcast around software architecture, software architecture. It's in German. And I wanted to highlight um, something that, that he pushed out uh, this week around the Spotify model. So maybe you have stumbled across that because that was kind of the, the next holy grail as, as, a, as a successor of Scrum or something like that. So depending to which manager you talk to. Um, and Eberhard is kind of demystifying a bit um, this, this model um, that is quite heavily pushed. So from my experiences in, in the management area, as, as I said, kind of the holy grail to make everything better, everything more agile. And um, he's putting things in the right place within this video. So if you find the time this, this weekend or this week, definitely worth watching. And with that, I'm at the end of today's session. I hope I had some news for you, some interesting stuff, some stuff to catch up. And with that, I wish you a nice Saturday, a nice weekend and a successful next week. See you next Saturday. Until then, bye.